but deliverance ministries and i mean deliverance ministries deliverance of from of spirits from christians that's what these ministries are doing and they are making money boy well brook thank you for taking the time to visit with me i'm rick joiner from bible study company and uh just wanted to bring up a couple of things before we get started we've had a number of questions come in uh, over time, and they they have a theological nature to them, and they're kind of tough to wrestle with. And I know of no better person than to contact uh, my good friend Dr. Baruch Corman of Love Israel. Uh, Love Israel is literally a worldwide organization, and we highly recommend that you go to loveisrael.org and make sure you check out the YouTube channel that he has. I'll link it down below so that you guys can. Um, Go and like and subscribe to his work. We've been friends for quite a while, and we are very thankful for uh, Brooke in showing us how to study scripture, to live a praiseworthy life, to find the plans and pur purposes of God. Now, the other thing is we would really like you to support his organization, uh, support ours as well, but we really like you to support his and uh, so again, we uh, thank you guys for attending. Now, you're going to hear several different um, questions that pop up. And uh, as we go forward, we'll um, just talk about what those questions are. So do you want to tackle the first one, which has two parts for me? Well, first of all, hi, Rick. Uh, shalom to you from Israel. I appreciate those kind words. It's uh, always uh, uh, delightful for me to be with you and and especially with your wife, Mary, when Rivka and I and all of us are together. But I guess it's just you and me right now. So, yes, let's let's begin and tackle that that first question. And I agree with you that um, that Mary's much nicer than me. I didn't say that. I just said it was always nice when the four of us are together, too. I just I just added that in. So, um, OK, so. Dr. Michael Heiser, as you know, has burst onto this theological scene, if you want to call it that. Um, he's written two books. One is called The Unseen Realm, which is used a lot. Uh, it's quite a tome, but it's used a lot in academic circles to discuss certain aspects of the Old Testament and Hebrew language. The other book he's written, well, and he's probably got other ones, but is a slimmed down version of that called The Supernatural. Now, I'm in seminary, and one of our seminary, we were required to study this book and do a book report on it. Now, his central central thesis is that um, in Genesis 1.26, where it says, let us uh, make man in our image, his thesis happens to be uh, that the us there is the divine counsel. And so my very first question is, briefly, if you could tell us a little bit about um, the divine counsel and where it fits into scripture, and we're, I'll give everybody a hint that it doesn't fit here, and there's a reason why that is, but we'll also explain it. So uh, can you tell us why the divine counsel fits into this, not doesn't fit into this, but what the divine counsel is? Well, I, th I think you asked a couple different questions. Uh, in Daniel chapter uh, 7, we see that there were thrones set up and those who sat upon the throne in the heaven. And therefore, we're talking about thrones in the plural, and it seems to be that there's some uh, meeting, some council, as he coins, to refer to perhaps a, a heavenly council that that uh, sits with God, and and not that God needs help to make decisions, but simply we see that that description in the Scripture. So that's one interpretation of that. It talks about the the sons of God. We see that in a couple different ways playing out in the Scripture terms relating to that. But but with your permission, Rick, let's let's look. And if you have your Bible, it might help us. Uh, I'm looking at the Hebrew text, and I think we see the same thing in the English or whatever language someone has, but this is a great example, in my opinion, and I'm not trying to be unkind to, to anyone, that's not my heart, that's not my, my desire, but sometimes people coin something, and then because this is kind of their pet thing, 
They like to uh, see that in many different places. And the problem is that they, they forego simple hermeneutical and exegetical principles that have been handed down for centuries. And they ignore that because they want to further their interpretations or their doctrinal uh, inventions. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point because that was one of the things when Mary and I first came to you and started learning and watching your videos is breaking down what you were doing. And on Bible Study Company, I'll put this link below too. Uh, we have Dr. Baruch's 26 or 27 principles on our website. And we also did some podcasts showing how we use those. So, so, and that's a really big thing that you just said, because people tend to put their own view into the scripture and they learn from the pulpits a lot of time, the very same thing that the pastor has put his own view into the scripture. And then that becomes a denomination or a doctrine, but it really isn't. So I think your point is let's let the scripture speak what you're about to do. Well, uh, two things initially. Number one, those principles are not mine. They have Correct. been, been uh, uh, spoken of, taught for a long, long time by many people. I'm just repeating them. So they did not originate with me. But there's, there's again, a couple things that need to be pointed out. When, when we talk about... about Man, and I'm speaking about man in a very uh, broad sense, male and female, as we'll see. Let us create man in our image. This is God speaking. The problem is, if it's the divine counsel instead of God, then we have a problem with our identity and who's creating. Let me give Good you an point. example. If, if the divine counsel is making man... Well, then you have a problem because it's God who created us, not the divine council. So right there, we have a, a theological problem that, that borders on heresy, that, that God's not the creator. And we know biblically, if we look at Colossians chapter one, it is Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, who created things and maintained things, holds things, all things hold together because of him. He is the, the cause of, of everything. So if it's the divine council, we have a conflict with scripture. So that's and, one. And from it's a also, and they're also created. The divine council is part of God's heavenly family and they're created. That's right. We're not talking about uh, the Godhead uh, also referred to as the Trinity. And many people will ask, do I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? Yes, I do. Perfect. Me too. Yep. But, but let's look at this and here again. If we just allow the scripture and how the Holy Spirit inspired it to be written down, it clarifies something. And the problem is people run to their, their pet terms, their doctrines and such, rather than examining the scripture. So let's do that. Go to, if you could, to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. And these, just, these two verses mm -hmm. clarify something. So let's begin. Vayomer Elohim, and God said, Nase Adam, let us make man be salmenu, be salmenu in our image. And then it says, Kid Mutenu, in accordance to our likeness. Now, this is important because we see in verse 26, our image, our likeness. But now let's go down to verse 27. And we see here, and God created man, same thing, vayivra, instead of nas, nase, we see a different verb, instead of make, it's the word create. And God created the man, notice what it says, not betsamenu, but betsamo, in his image. Mm -hmm. So this tells us something very important. In verse 27, we learn that God created man in his image, in the image of God. So the problem is, if we interpret verse 26 and say this is the divine counsel, we have a conflict. Verse 27 says it's in the image of God. In exactly. verse 26, it's in the image of, of us. So verse 26 
for these two to be in agreement and scriptures not at odds with one another, the us there must refer to God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead. So we are created in the image of God. Of course, that word image, Salem, has to do with reflect. We're called to reflect the, the character, the holiness, the righteousness. That's how God originally created us before sin uh, attacked uh, that purpose. None of this surprised God. But here we can, can look at the text and say undeniably the divine counsel, as uh, uh, this individual says, cannot be the interpretation of, of Genesis 1, verse 26. Before we could meet, um, I did some of my own research and uh, trying to figure out what this whole thing is, because I shared with you in my email uh, asking to have a private talk about this uh, prior to this. The issue for me was I it was very difficult because um, I'm just in seminary, just will be breaking down he Hebrew later. But the interesting thing is, is that uh, it's really hard to get to the us, which you just did a really nice job breaking that down for us as well. But there's a, this is what some of the scholars would say, and this would come out of the Net Bible commentary they would say that this is called the majestic plural or the divine plural. Heiser brings that up too. The problem is, and in Judaism too, they're saying that it is the divine council. And so um, can you, I know you just went over it and everything, but can you just make a comment towards that? And, well, and it, so, sorry to interrupt, but it was very helpful for me in, t in your explanation of why that's taking place. Uh, in uh in the us why pe so many people think this now well, or I, let's let's deal with the the initial question you mentioned judaism judaism sure. of course does not believe in the trinity therefore Correct. they have to have some explanation for this but here again in the same way that the, that the gentleman uh, dr heiser is incorrect so is judaism in this because we see these two verses laid out side by side, verse 26, verse 27. So you cannot have one verse saying that we're created in the image of God. And then the other verse saying, no, we're created in the image of a divine council. It, it much is, is, is taught here that this, this plural in verse 26 refers to Godhead. And here again, Judaism those who, who subscribe to the Zohar speaks about a triune God, and they use, in regard to that, this idea of the plural being used for abundance, or as you said, the, the majestic plural. Uh, they also see that. So it's not a conflict. If you look at, at a broader sense of, of the interpreters in Judaism, uh, we also can arrive at that from the plural of let us make man in our image. There's no problem. It's referring to God, verse 27 confirms that. And can you then uh, describe a little bit about what the Zohar is and uh, why they believe in a triune God? Did, did I catch that right? Right. The Zohar is just another word, and I do not recommend this. It's not scripture. The Zohar is another term for the uh, Kabbalah. It's mystical. Here again, I, I would not recommend it, but I'm just pointing out that within it, they see, for example, you have the uh, a phrase, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh Hashem Tzavot, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So this three, they see three oftentimes relating to, to God. And we would agree with that, that the three equals one and one equals three. We may not be able to get our earthly minds around that, but but there is a triune character to God. The Kabbalah uh, uh, agrees with that, uh, espouses that, not in the same way as the Trinity necessarily, but allows for that. So anyway, what That's I'm good. saying is that this divine counsel does not even have to come into play in regard to this and ought not come into play in regard to, to this these verses. And some critique I saw in scholarship was that the whole idea of a divine plural or a majestic plural 
is kind of a man made up way to explain this. What would you say to that? Well, I, I would simply say that there has to be an explanation that that unites these two verses together. So if you want to unite them and say the scripture does not con contradict one one another, one scripture contradic contradicting another, you have to have some explanation. And the divine plural fits that in keeping this, this view that God created man. And man was created in the image of God. That's what we see in verse 27. So verse 26, and the, and I, I understand this, majestic plural being an explanation in order to, to unite these two verses together and not have them speaking two different things which are opposed with one another. Well, and I think it's an excellent um, principle of hermeneutics that you just used in verse 26, the us in our image. And then, uh, and then in verse 27, it's hermeneutics is keeping the two in context. And I, and I think that's an outstanding uh, way of looking at it. Now, in our last talk, I said, some of the scholars would then say to you, uh, because you're talking about the Trinity, and I absolutely loved your explanation, you, I said to you, they would say to you, you're taking Christianity um, version of the of Trinity and inserting it into um, this area, and you can't do that. Because and but your automatic response to me was, well, my my response to that. I don't, I don't remember our conversation per se, but but my response is, you have things in the Scripture that that demands the the explanation for them to be the Trinity. For example, it talks in the scripture about our, the glorious appearing of, of God the Father and our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. So the appearance of God, and also you have two there, that would require a, a appearing would be in the plural because there's two appearing, but it's not, it's in the one. So the only way that the grammar can be consistent is that that we see unity between God the Father and God the Son. So we see many things, baptizing them in the name, not the names plural, but in the name of, of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So As it's not one. names, but it's name. There's nice. many things we see in the scripture that demands that the, the explanation that holds things together and keeps scripture from contradicting one another is this view of a, a trinity. So we bring that, and I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate that. We bring that, but we don't invent it ourselves. We see scripture demanding it. And then because scriptures demand that, we can utilize it in other places because it's already been something that's been established in, in, in the sense that it's a, a legitimate understanding of a verse. Why is this word for appearing singular and not plural if we're talking about two? The answer is, just like we said, three is one. If it's talking about God the Father and God the Son, we could also see them being one. Three persons, or in this case, the two persons, Father and Son, but being one. And that, and when I asked you that question, you know, you're borrowing, um, you brought up something that's near and dear to my heart, which was, well, scripture interprets scripture. And so your explanation is outstanding. You added more than I even thought you were going to, but it, what's really nice about it is that's another um, uh, principle. Like you just used, you explained hermeneutics in 126 and 127, keeping them consistent. And now the Bible is progressively giving us revelation and it's interpreting that and confirms it is what you're saying. Is that fair? There's, there's, yes. There's many places where we see uh, God being revealed through the sun in a unique way that could never be done by, by you or me and people responding to Yeshua by worshiping him, uh, by saying that he is our, our God, 
as Thomas did, and many other things. And because of that, we see that, that we, we, we have the divinity of Yeshua. And if Yeshua is divine, but there's one God, the, 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 the Trinity is the explanation that holds it together. Those who deny the Trinity, uh, usually, in fact, I can't think of a situation where it's not the case, those who deny the Trinity really deny the divinity of, of, of yeah, Jesus. Yeah, and this okay. is the problem. If you deny the divinity of, of Yeshua, then you don't know who he is. If you don't know who he is, then you really haven't received the biblical Messiah. If you haven't received the biblical Messiah, you're lost still. So I strongly believe that the divinity of Yeshua, believing that, that the Son is the Son of God and is fully divine, if you don't believe that, you're not saved. Well, see, that is an outstanding uh, comment because that's one of the things that I talk to a lot of Jehovah Witnesses about is they don't believe that Messiah is, um, that the Lord Jesus Christ is divine. And I can literally say, without looking into their hearts or anything, if you believe that, this is one of the rare circumstances where you can say to someone, you are not saved by believing that. And or that's not believing that or believing he's not divine. Yeah. If he's not divine and he's not the son of God, you don't have your sins forgiven because he had to forgive Adam's sin being sinless and only God is sinless. So, uh, the, so if you don't believe that he is divine or part of the Trinity, which they don't, and, uh, he's, you're not saved. And, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. So, yeah, that's a really big item. Now, uh, the other thing that um, Heiser brings up, there's two other po points. One is he brings up the us at the Tower of Babel. Let us go down. And that would be similar to what we're talking about here. Or is the I, I Tower believe so. Of the yeah, I believe okay. so. All right. And then the second thing is he brings up Psalm 82. Uh quite frequently, the, it, which is um, the psalm that he says uh, changed his whole mindset when he was studying Hebrew um, at the University of Wisconsin. So um, see, there is a Wisconsinite, you know, some of them. Um, so, uh, um, so it says a psalm is Asaph, God takes his stand in his own congregation. Different English versions render this differently. Uh, which is causes a lot of struggle. He he judges in the midst of the rulers. This is what Heiser is saying is the divine counsel. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Because this, he says, comes out of the Tower of Babel. Um, and out of the Tower of Babel, he turned it turned him over to the divine counsel for punishment. And you can talk about, I'm just telling you what he's saying. Vindic yeah. and vindicate the weak and the fatherless do do justice to the afflicted and destitute rescue the um the weak and needy deliver them out of the hand of the wicked they do not know nor do they understand they walk about in darkness all the foundations of the earth are shaken i said you are gods all of you are sons of the most high nevertheless you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes arise O god judge the earth for it is you who possess all the nations. So I just wanted to bring that up because uh, that's part of his thesis. Okay. Um, here again, we're, we're talking in, in Psalm 82 about a totally different context. Right. And we, we do not deny that verses like this and others, as I mentioned in Daniel 7, there seems to be thrones set up and those who sit upon the throne and the great thing is they always agree with God, always agree with God. They're always sensitive and committed to the will of God. And what we find here in Psalm 82, the term Elohim, this name of God is probably the most, along with the term El, this is plural Elohim related to it, but, but relates to, most would say Elohim relates to judges. There are several places in the scripture where the term Elohim is translated by, by several different English translation as uh, judge or judges in the plural. And so what we're seeing here is this divine counsel, as he puts it, uh, agrees with the judgment of God. 
and and oftentimes speak, and we see a poetic uh, factor in that oftentimes they speak in regard to the desires of man, bringing them before God for God to respond, for God to rule, which he'll do in his timing and in a perfect way. But I, I would not put uh, uh, a great amount of, of emphasis on the divine counsel beyond a few verses that we see. I don't know uh, Dr. Heiser's uh, premise, how far he takes it or what, but I would just simply say in uh, Psalm 82, I understand this, this counsel that is set up of judging. Uh, but in Genesis, I would not at all bring, for the reasons I said, the divine counsel into that. Very in, good. in Babylon, uh, when it says, let us go down here again, I, I've always seen that. I haven't looked at it lately, but I've always seen that as God uh, uh, thwarting the, the foolishness and the rebelliousness of man, foolishness wanting to get up into heavens, believing that man can attain that through his own work. Uh, obviously, that's not uh, biblically sound. We can't enter into the heavens through our own work. So I would just say those uh, uh, simple responses to, to those issues. And one of the other thesis things that he said in his book was that um, the divine, that he God turned over the divine council to the 70 nations or something like that. And um, they ruled over, that's where the Prince of Persia comes from and all this other stuff. And um, so they, uh, they took worship for themselves. That's his thesis. They, they took worship for themselves. The, the divine, divine council, council. Yeah. He turned them over worship? to the, yeah, because um, that's where idol worship came from. That's where he, he's saying. Yeah, I see it. I, I, I don't know the basis for, for that view. I don't know the basis of the divine council turning things over to anyone. I don't know any verses uh, for that. So I, I don't know where he's coming from on that. Those yeah, things. I got, I got lost and I had to do that book report. So um, I, I really appreciate it. Now, this has led into um, a question that's come up. Uh, now this will sound kind of odd to people, but, uh, several, uh, I think it's Matthew 24, that some Muslims um, are basically saying, and possibly some Jehovah Witnesses are using this too, that Jesus is not divine based on a scripture verse in Matthew tw uh, 24 or 36, isn't it? Yes. So should I, should I read it? Well, the, the, the verse says there, that uh, in regard to the rapture, it says no one knows the, the, the day or the hour, uh, not the angels, and some manuscripts says as well, not even the sun. Now, what I would say in regard to this, we have to remember that Messiah, he, when he became flesh, he's the eternal son of God. He became flesh, and with the incarnation, he never ceased to be fully God. Correct. He never ceased to be fully God. But he emptied himself. For example, as he lived in, in a body, he couldn't be everywhere. But he knew all things. For example, we have that scripture in, at the end of John chapter 1 with Nathaniel, where he saw Nathaniel, where his body would not allow him to be. But nevertheless, he saw that. So we see the omniscience of the son. Here again, theologians speak of this, limited in the body. Well, we also have to emphasize something that's also related to hermeneutics, and that is when the scripture speaks about Yeshua, what are they emphasizing? Usually, it's either him being the son of man, being fully man, or him being fully God. This union between being fully human and being fully God, this hypostolic union, something that theologians speak about frequently in, in books you can read it, this unity. Now, in the scripture, for the purpose of revelation, and this is a big deal, for the purpose of revelation, we see Messiah speaking, and he says things oftentimes because it's his humanity being, being emphasized. For example, in John 7. He, he says, you know, I'm not going up 
to Jerusalem now. Very important that he says that. Well, wait a second. He has to go up. It's one of, we're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of the festivals that every Jewish man 20 and over must go up. So he says, I'm not going up. Why? Because there are those seeking to kill him. And so he's concerned. Well, this shows something about his humanity, that Messiah, although he's God in the flesh, God incarnate, he was tempted at all points, just as we are. The book of Hebrews says that. And that means that things can hurt him. He felt pain. He can also feel anxiety and stress, but he never sinned. None of these things that, that humanity can feel, every human being can feel, ever caused him to sin or to miss God's mark. So we see in John how he doesn't want to go up to Jerusalem because there are those who are, are going to kill him. But we see because of obedience, he goes up. And then we see in that same seventh chapter, when they're talking about uh, uh, letters from different sects within Judaism, even though he's never studied at these different sects with them, at their establishments, he answers them. As though he has, he knows all these things. So in John chapter seven, it begins, that first part of the chapter begins with emphasizing his humanity, but later on, because he knows all things and can answer them based upon, upon their language, their terminology, how did he know this? He never studied with them. Well, he's God, he knows all things. So in the second part, it emphasizes his divinity, that he's the son of God. Going back to the scripture that we see here, it says here, not even the son, speaking about the son of man, knows the day or the hour. Now, in one sense, he knows all things. He's omniscient, but he has emptied himself in order to show us how to be the perfect human being. He is just that, yeah, that's the right. perfect yep. human being. And being we're supposed to follow human. him. Yep. Exactly. He did not reach into his divinity to be the perfect human being. He obeyed. He obeyed and brought his flesh into submissiveness as a man, the son of man. The so word of God, right? Says, Perfect. No one That's really good. The, no one knows the, the day or the hour, not even the son. What it speaks of here is his humanity, that he, in order to obey his father, to do the work that his father has given to him, is not, he does not have, as an example to us, he does not have to utilize his omniscience why he's the son of man what does the son of man do he's the example for us he obeys so it's not dependent upon him as the son of man knowing the day or the hour in no way should that scripture be used to attack his divinity the context is emphasizing his humanity and his faithfulness and his obedience in spite of the fact that he this kenosis, this important Greek word for emptying, he's not relying upon his divinity in order to obey and be the perfect uh, man. Doesn't rely upon his divinity. He walks in humanity, humility and humanity in being obedient, that perfect man as an example for us. So we always have to ask ourselves, what's being emphasized? When we don't understand this, we make errors and those errors cause us to have uh, uh, theological problems, which, which leads us to heresy, and the heresy it leads us to is to believe that, that Yeshua is not the divine Son of God. Yeah, I think that's an outstanding. Another type of Bible study principle is paying attention to what's being said and how it's being said. And I think for, for everybody just to, to um, look at Bible study company, and when you see an icon, let's say you're in John, and you want to study this concept that Dr. Baruch has just uh, had outlined for us, uh, you can look and see an icon there, and that's Dr. Baruch, um, through his, his videos, showing us how to look at this scripture and, and, and basically studying with us. So make sure that you go to those videos, make sure you take a look at it, and he explains that in greater detail. From an application standpoint, you know, because we always want to learn how to live praiseworthy, what I'm taking away from that 
is the plans and purposes of God by showing us this in scripture is so that we follow the Lord and focus on the things that he's telling us to focus on. And it's important to see where the, his acting in his full divinity, when it, in his full humanity. And maybe there's times when he does both of them. He's together with them. I could think of um, him walking on water um, or changing water into wine. It's, it looks like it's both things. Very would good. you? Yes. Yeah. I, okay. I would agree. When he walks in water, the man's walking on water, but it manifests his his divinity that he's connected with the heavens. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened is by our discussion this last time, this has caused Mary and I to start to want to go through the Gospels and start to see this in separate. It's a new way of looking at the Gospels. Uh, and we're actually clicking on the icons and watching some of your videos. So there you go. Uh, mi miracles still happen. <laughs> that, that we're studying or miracles are happening because we're watching your videos? Uh, I was kidding and saying for you to watch those videos is, is miraculous that you're you're taking the time and doing that so okay so um now so that's that's that is that kind of shows this whole trinity i know that we've all talked about uh we've talked about some of the problems with the trinity which will we've wrapped up here but what i want to do is if you were to simply share with us, because this is confusing to people. And even in the seminary classes, um, we were actually talking about how to explain the roles of God in the, in the Trinity. Now, I, I can understand that he's one, and, and, but then when you start saying he's operating in different roles, you can get into a weird thing called modalism where the God operates in different modes. And, yeah, but it's I, I, Rick, I, I always stay away from these, these roles, or as you put modalism, all Very of good. that leads us into a direction uh, that does not accurately uh, relate or, or reveal anything concerning the Trinity, in my opinion. See, I, I can't, um, express my appreciation well enough for your comment just now, because as, as I was in the seminary class and we were looking through this, it came to my conclusion uh, in my own heart and mind that, no, I'm just going to look at the Lord as one, and he's going to be worshiped from all, I, just his plans and pur purposes it. I'm going to leave it as a mystery. I'm not going to try to try to figure it out. Um, and I like the way you said it. Um, I don't know if I made any sense at all or in, to the listeners, but uh, I think it's really good that you said that. Do you have any advice? Well, it's just we're talking about the nature of a transcendent God that is so much greater than, than his creation. And to be so uh, uh, bold, Maybe perhaps to be so arrogant for a human being like myself or like every other person to believe that we can understand this, this unique God. So basically what, what I like to say, and I mentioned it earlier, I believe that, that God has, has the Godhead who, who reveals himself in three persons, three distinct persons who are related. The three is one, the one is three. Can we understand that? No, but do we affirm that? Yes, we do, because the scripture strongly, and I want to emphasize that, strongly uh, presents that. Otherwise, as I said earlier, you have contradictions in the scripture, serious ones. And, and I think um, this whole concept of trying to explain it and that it's a mystery, I, it, it settles, I'll just be honest, it settles my heart because if you look at Psalm 19, the Lord is breaking down the creation. And how can we, who are created, understand the mind of a creator who's outside of space and time and could speak all this into existence? We can't. And, well and, that, and that's why six days of creation is six days of creation, period. And 
God can do it however he wants to. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I don't want to. Um, and the other thing is, one of the biggest problems that creationists, we weren't going down this path, but one of the things that creationists want to do is fit evolution. In. And, I, and I sit back and I say, okay, listen, he, he made the trees and everything. He had everything all ready for, for life. Life needs to consume fuel immediately. So how can these trees have fruit on them? And, I, and one time I was at a, a replica of a tabernacle. They opened up the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And then I remembered the um, budding stick of Aaron, his rod, and the Lord took a dead piece of wood and put fruit on it in the evening, o- overnight. And so it said one morning and evening. He did even better than that. He put fruit on it. A dead piece of wood. I said, I got it. <laughs> so he had everything ready for uh, for everybody. So is it okay if I switch gears on you? Or do you have any comments sure. about no, the Aaron's no. we, we dead can piece? Or, you're just going to let me gears. die right there? That's good. All right. So um, one of the things that I wanted to ask about is uh, the sinner's prayer. One t- um, When I was young, somebody presented the gospel to me. It was a pastor. And I'd never been in church before. Well, excuse me, that's not true. I I wasn't churched is in a general rule. We didn't go to church. We didn't make church priority. And God just showed the gospel. I didn't even understand what he was talking about, sin, you know, being on the throne of your life, whatever. But the point that he said is, would you like to have a relationship with God? And I thought, I don't even, I didn't even know one could. And so, but anyway, the long short of it is he asked me to pray this prayer, sinner's prayer. And boy, I prayed it with my whole heart and boom, I knew that God was real. Prior to that, I had no clue that God was real. And so Pete and I had been in uh, working in youth prisons and we'd present the gospel. We'd even have kids with tears in their eyes. And at the same time we were doing this, um, I won't name the people, but he's really famous for doing evangelism and he is, he shows the law and he goes, runs around, talks to people. And he's saying that the praying the sinner's prayer with somebody is really wrong because um, uh, you're doing the praying for the person, the person's not praying. And we have a Bible study company in our, on our area of, in our blog, a salvation prayer that's biblically based a hundred percent of it. And it's affirming the scriptures. And you know, as well as I do, we like to, at Bible study company, we like to pray the scriptures back to the Lord as, you know, especially Psalms and worship the Lord like that. But what was really interesting to me is we decided, okay, we won't say, I think what they're worried about is people who uh, are false converts, but, but that's like the gun argument. What kills people, the gun or the person shooting the gun? And so it's always going to be the heart of the person who prays the prayer that's the issue, not the prayer. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so for us, I would say, okay, okay, you need to ask the Lord yourself to save you. And so just to see what would happen. And without exception, these people would close their eyes and they'd stop. And they'd open their eyes and they'd say, I have no idea what to pray. And I, and Pete and I would take out our, our prayer and we'd say, you need to pray this to the Lord yourself, but I'll read it to you. And if you want, you can follow along with it. We're not praying it for them. They're praying it. So one time when I was watching your thing, you said, this is, this is, now, like in coming into the church, there's an anti sinner's prayer thing. What are your thoughts about what I just said? Well, I, I've always uh, accepted what's usually referred to as a sinner's prayer. I know that there's a, a well, one well known pastor in the, the DC area that says it's totally unbiblical to invite Jesus into your heart. Well, it's an idiom meaning. I'm accepting him into my life. Uh, I, I am making a commitment to him. And the scripture says that you need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And that's why people use this expression, inviting him into my heart. I don't think there's anything unbiblical, anything problematic about that. I think it's very good to lead someone in that 
So they are affirming biblical things. Uh, we, we do all the time. We, we want people to acknowledge their sinfulness, that they can't save themselves, that they're trusting in the sufficiency of the cross, the shedding of Messiah's blood, blood, that he died upon that cross, that he was buried, that we believe that not only he died, but he rose again on the third day. It's very important that we affirm the resurrection. So there's certain things for one to be saved that they must affirm and believe and, and confess with their mouth and, and believe in their heart. So it's good to lead someone through that so their salvation experience is indeed biblically sound. So these people that, that here again, you're always going to find someone for the sake of being different, being new, being controversial, anything like that. None of that interests me whatsoever. I think that that sinner's prayer has been around for a long time, and God has used it mightily, and that we should continue to, to use that biblical-based prayer in bringing people to confession and acceptance of the gospel. I totally agree with you, uh, and uh, I really appreciate it. And here's something interesting. Um, that Paul said in uh, Ephesians 3.17, when you said it's not biblical to ask the Lord in our hearts, he says 3.17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that mm. being rooted and grounded in love. And, Excellent scripture. Yeah. And I also go to, um, I'm going to bring up a pet interpretation, if you will, and you can, are more than happy to correct me. Uh, but the parable of the soils is very interesting to me because in my life, I represented the, the, thing, the thing that grew up and tribulation came in and it wilted and uh, the Lord was kind enough to bring me back and uh, I'm grateful for that. But I also see where if we don't pray with somebody, if we don't have them affirm and make a decision for Christ, um, th the little um, the raven or the bird of prey can come in and take that seed away, which I know that as soon as somebody hears the gospel, the enemy is going to come in and try to distract them in every single way possible to get them to disbelieve. And I'll give you an example of this. I, I was able to talk to somebody who was Catholic, and we visited about the importance of being born again. I didn't, I didn't attack the Catholic Church, but I just said, here's what we need to do about being born again. And I'm telling you, Brooke, after I could see it in his eyes that he, in fact, he just went oh, like that after he accepted Christ through our, our prayer that we had that everything was new. He said, Rick, everything's new. Everything's, and, and then his sister showed up on the door the next day. She's a medium. And you could see the seduction coming in to try to pull him back. And I just, it's very scary. We saw that with the prisoners too. It seemed like they got attacked as soon as they, um, accepted Christ and were starting to walk, they got attacked in many different directions. And I said, hang on, because you're going to be attacked. The enemy wants you back in his kingdom. Well, I would he say this. If, if a person is, is saved, the enemy loses all ability to have that person back. But the enemy can bring adversity, affliction. The enemy can attack you having a successful and praiseworthy testimony. Correct. It can, the enemy can hinder you from, from being faithful to God and doing what God would have you to do. But uh, the enemy cannot, if one has been born again, the enemy has no authority over that soul to take it back. That yeah. Covenantal relationship is eternally secure through the sufficiency of, of the work of Messiah. And, and as the scripture says in John chapter 10, it says that no one can pluck you out of my hands. Yeah. Um, I'm very thankful that you added that in. What, what I, and what I meant in sharing that, and I am 100% in agreement that we can't lose our salvation once we're born again, but it's the, praiseworthy life. He would want to pull those prisoners back in to living a life of sin and theft 
and uh, drinking and drugs and all that. In fact, we met many of them that were shot up. But it, to and uh, here's what I here's in agreement with you, so that we don't produce fruit for Christ, and um, and and live praiseworthy. So yes, I totally agree with that comment, and I'm very glad that you brought that up. So um, thank you for that. Uh, let me see my next question that we've got. Um, is there a difference between the kingdom of God and the church? Because we saw the Lord speaking a lot uh, about the kingdom of God is at hand, and you're close to the kingdom of God. And I know that he was supposed to uh, in Daniel, it shows that they didn't accept him. So that was prophesied as the king. But um, it, what if they would have, we can't speculate, but what if they would have accepted Christ? It, it, what's the difference between the kingdom of God and and the body of Christ? What is the difference between the two? Well, the kingdom of God, although the reality of it exists, we also have to remember something. He says, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth, the new Jerusalem, which is the final state of the kingdom of God. It says also in the book of Revelation, behold, all things are new. So in one sense, that kingdom in the fullness is, is not here where it's going to be created. But the kingdom presence, which is God's presence, can enter in. His glory is in this world, can be. He manifests it. So that kingdom and the nearness is there through the gospel, through that relationship, having intimacy with God, having a, a presence uh, of God in one's life through the Holy Spirit. That's also reflected in a kingdom experience. But, but the church is consisting of people from every language, every people group, every nation, eth every ethnic ethnicity, all of that. But those are kingdom people. They're not in the kingdom today. So I, I do not see uh, uh, to say, I mean, I would strongly say there's a humongous difference between the church and the kingdom. Uh, right now, the, the church is in this world. Now, of course, those who have died are, are in the kingdom of heaven with, with Messiah in the very presence of God. But that heaven is not eternal. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, the new Jerusalem. That second creation, which ultimately is that kingdom of God. So I, I'm I'm surprised. I've I've never heard. I mean, if you're talking about those who want to say that the the kingdom is now that theology, dominion theology, uh, but very yeah. very poor theology, a doctrine that that uh, has tremendous uh, problems and holes in it. Uh, yeah, uh, in the kingdom of God, in the New Jerusalem, Satan won't be present. He will be in the lake that burns with fire. During the new, during the the millennial kingdom, he will be bound for those thousand years. Satan is not bound now. He he is still the prince of this age, although he's been defeated. But he knows his time is short, and he's coming down, and he he's working diligently, just as you said, to hinder our testimony and ministry being done. Yeah, let me um, throw it at, from a scholarship standpoint. One of the very first theological classes I had uh, was uh, that the kingdom of God, there was a couple of different theologians that said the kingdom of God is, is the Jewish nation. That was the kingdom on earth, the Jewish nation, and um, they didn't accept Christ. And then he, the Lord had to pivot to the uh, Jew and Gentile together, as Paul talked about, and that became the body of Christ. That was where their distinction was 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 involved. Yeah. I, I don't really un understand understand that. Nothing surprises God. God's purpose from the very beginning is a kingdom, not with just Jewish people, but but we look that that every family of the earth potentially can be Abraham. blessed. Mm -hmm. So so that Abrahamic covenant exactly, Rick. So yeah, Genesis you know, twelve. Yeah. These these theologians, uh, and I'm talking about poor theologians. You know, you can find someone to say about anything. I know, I but know. but within the the framework of of orthodoxy, uh, those things are are far removed from from the orthodox faith. And when I say orthodox, sound faith is another way of saying that. 
Okay. Well, I, that, I really appreciate that because, um, yeah, it, for me, the, the seminary experience is pu- putting some pieces together, but it's also giving me a drone view high up. Uh, that's why I'm so appreciative of being able to learn by watching your videos, how to study scripture and then having you to kind of fix my thinking, if you want to call it that, um, as we go through, but it's giving me an overview and a drone view of what the church, what the church at large is trying to wrestle with. And it's just all coming down to this. Got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's the, the biblically sound church that affirms this book and the doctrines that are found within this book. But you also have many that are in what the world will call the church in a very broad sense. Correct. And you'll have much heresy within this broader definition. And, and people are confused and people, people assume things, people state things. People say, well, you know this. And I always say, no, I, I never knew that. That's not what I see in the scripture. I, 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 I never happen. have experienced that. And yeah. so, uh, you know, new theologies are born all the time. But but most of them are from the pit of hell and do not line up with with the scripture. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I don't know about you, but when people are asking me questions, you know, theologically, um, and what my opinion is, the one thing that comes across is I have to get a definition of what they mean when the of the very question that they're asking. I have like like you just described, you've got to, in order to be on the same page, you got to figure out what the definition is. But, and, and there's a lot of terms that are thrown out. Now I'm going to pivot again to another question. That's a big one for people because deliverance ministries are showing up and they seem to wane and go and come, but deliverance ministries. And I mean, deliverance ministries, deliverance of, from, of spirits from Christians. That's what these ministries are doing. And they are making money, boy, and they're doing all kinds of conferences. So here's the question. Um, what do you, first off, what do you think of um, these deliverance ministries? The- it, it, it depends on, on their, their, their doctrine, what they're, what they're teaching, what they're doing. We, we all have things in our life as believers that, that we need victory over, that we need freedom. A believer can can struggle with sin and that string sin can have a stronghold in his life and and prayer can 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 break that stronghold and truth can break that stronghold so uh here again you hear the term deliverance why well, i'm in favor of deliverance i'm in favor of ministry but but oftentimes within that term deliverance ministries it seems to also include a lot of, of poor things. I have a, a friend that uh, uh, is very committed to deliverance ministries. I believe he's theologically sound. I believe that God uses him. I believe that ministry is done and people experience the freedom that that true faith is to produce in their life through uh, him being an instrument that God uses. So I also see things on television and, and hear things about deliverance ministries that both my friend and myself, we, we you know, uh, cringe at to hear mm-hmm. such poor things. So it's just like anything else. You know, people say Christianity. Well, that can mean a, a wide variety of, of things by the term Christianity in the same way deliverance ministries can as well. And I totally agree with the... I, I've seen a lot of things that, that we that I've struggled with personally, other people that have been in our life that we've talked about submitting to the word of God, submitting to uh, God if, to live a praiseworthy life, not expecting God to be doing things from us, because that's kind of the way Christianity is. They read the Bible so that they can get something from it and have God do things for us. But not to go into the weeds on this, I've seen massive amounts of healing because that to me, that's what deliverance is. There's, there's healing through the word of God, through the Lord revealing different things. And like you said, prayer and, and things like that. Now, uh, this laying pre- on of hands, uh, um, many things God can use to bring about that healing, that deliverance. And, and here's the key. 
the deliverance is for the purpose of obeying God. There you go. So if, if that's not the objective, then I, I, I don't think God's going to be in it. And I think that that it's it's false. But if the purpose of someone saying, I need God to, to help me, I'm struggling this area, whether it be doubt, whether it be fear, whether it be some uh, addiction that's displeasing to God, whether it's drugs or alcohol, and there's a whole bunch of things that people can be addicted to, uh, food, whatever. Uh, right. God wants to set people free from that. God's able to do that. And God uses people uh, to, to as instruments for that. God does it. But sometimes it's that laying on of hands. It's, it's that person sharing with them the, the truth that, that causes that person to recognize the authority and realize they don't have to live under this oppression. They don't have to live in this defeated life. So God can use people, and I, I'm grateful that he does. Good. And so that brings up a couple of questions. For example, um, you hear um, Christians and some in prayers, like I was in a lot of charismatic circles, and they'll say, we're going to bind Satan, and they'll, they'll pray that way. Can you describe what authority that Christians have in any of that? Well, Satan's been defeated. Satan's not going to be bound until uh, after Messiah returns. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he can be weakened. He can be hindered by prayer, by obedience and such. So uh, I wouldn't use the term bound. Uh, or but, bind, but yeah. I remember the scripture where it says the disciples come back and they say, you know, we saw Satan falling. What does that mean? He was not uh, having success. He was being brought down, defeated in his objective objectives because of the faithfulness of the disciples. So I wouldn't use the term bound because he's not going to be bound, but, but he can be, he can be, uh, he's already defeated, but he can be not successful in his objectives because of, of our commitment to the truth of holiness, of righteousness, and, and submitting to the purposes of God. Those things can, can bring about uh, the weakness of Satan's uh, influence in a given situation. Then, and that's outstanding. How would you um, say that you would pray against Satan? How, how would you? I, I would remind people of the cross. I would remind people of the power, the blood of Messiah. I would remind people that, that through when we, we walk in a desire to submit, that desire to submit brings that anointing. Now, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He's in us. He indwells us. But the question is, is that anointing there? The potential is always there, but it's through a commitment to the will of God. To and I think sometimes yeah. today, sorry? To live praiseworthy, yeah. To, to live a praiseworthy life. And He determines, God determines what's pr praiseworthy. And Satan hates that. Yep. Satan doesn't want us to live in a way that glorifies God. Satan wants us to live in a way that 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 glorifies him and shows his influence, his uh, authority over our life, rather than Messiah's authority over our life. Hence my example of the prisoners. Exactly. Yep. Um, OK, so um, human beings, we've heard in Scripture, body, soul and spirit. So I've asked you a couple questions. This goes along with spiritual warfare. Um, how, if, if Christians can have demons um, be oppressed by them, how are they oppressed by them? Like, for example, body, soul, and spirit, or is it soul and spirit are together in the body, or is it the three pieces? Do we re reflect the image of God, which I'm leaning more towards? That well, worth, I, worth I, I, I would say this. A true believer, as I just mentioned, he has the Holy Spirit. She has the Holy Spirit within him. Yep. So a believer cannot be possessed by, by a demon. But we can see that believers, when we violate the word of God, when we, we commit transgressions, iniquity, and sin, this gives Satan a degree of influence in our life. He can have that foothold that he builds into a stronghold and, and have influence over us to live a defeated 
and a life that's not honoring God. So that person is not possessed, but that person can be, I think, use the term oppress. So there's a difference between possession and oppression. So, so demons, uh, they might be, be cast away, but they're not going to be cast out of, meaning they might be having influence and they may be present in a situation where there's a believer, but that demon is never going to be able to enter into that, that, that inner man, that, that, that spiritual dimension of a believer. Okay, that's exactly what I was um, agreeing with you on. So, I mean, I, that is exactly what I believe. So, that's well, well very well said. Um, now, let me uh, wrap this up for people. Um, uh, I, I can break these down into um, the different topics, which will be shorter videos. But the one thing that's interesting to me is there are several is I've now um, learned in seminary, there are several different ways to study scripture. One is the inductive method, which Dallas Theological Seminary pushes a lot, which is observe, interpret, and apply the text. There's also the literal, historical, grammatical approach. Um, There's a devotional type of approach. And then there's the Jewish uh, exegesis called pardes, which is a, an, an acrostic, meaning several different words. I used to know what it meant, but I don't anymore. But f- my two questions are these, if you can hold them in your mind, is what are your thoughts about this in general? The, the, you, don't, you can pick one or the other, but I think our goal is always going to be live praiseworthy, not just to gain knowledge. But the, the whole part, the whole, what are your thoughts about all of these different versions? Oh. And what do you have a preference over one? When you construct a message, do you use any one of those? This is just an overview. No. Uh, there are exegetical principles that, that you can buy a book. And most of them are, are very good books. When you buy a book on what's called exegesis, which is a desire to pull out the meaning from the text there's rules, there's, there's uh, uh, principles that we apply to the text, and that's what I, I, I use myself. I believe sound exegetical methodology in order to, to discover what the text is communicating in an original sense, in a literal sense, using grammar, especially grammar, the meaning of words, tracing those words through the scripture, paying attention to context and all the things that the text contains. So uh, I just have, when I was in seminary many, many years ago, uh, over 30, 30, about 35 years ago, uh, we just called, took a class on exegesis. Now they have also hermeneutics, which is just uh, theories, methodologies of, of basically uh, exegetical uh, thoughts, principles that, that are, are brought in, in in helping one discover the meaning of the text. So you mentioned PARDES. It's simply an acronym for PSHAT, which is the, the simple meaning of the te- text. REMIS, which is the word for hints. So what the text kind of hints to. And then there's DRASH, which is uh, inquiring, and it's kind of what you can inquire from the text. It's also a step away. And there's sod, which is mystery. And this is, you know, to me, I don't like any of that because what it's saying is, well, there's the, the straightforward meaning, which is where I would be. And then people kind of go off on tangents. And then the final one, sod, is basically saying you can't see in this interpretation of mine, you can't see the connection between the text, the words there, and what I'm telling you. It's a mystery, This, t- these two things. To me, that, that borders on heresy. If you cannot see the clear connection between the interpretation and the text, it's very problematic. So uh, I'll, I'll just leave it with that. Uh, buy a book on exegesis, invest uh, uh, 10 bucks. You can probably get a, a paperback book. Uh, uh, most of them are very good. That goes through the standard ways to study the Bible. And that, that uh, list that I, I made for you, Rick, just really combines a lot of that and um, helps people understand these principles. 
and I'll link that at the bottom of these videos so that people can go to that list and uh, take a look at it. Well, the, um, those what's really exciting to me is getting started, especially if you're married, start studying scripture together um, and put those principles in play. And I got to tell you, your mind is going to fight back and find every distraction you can come up. And that is spiritual warfare, is the enemy would love to get us distracted from the word of God. So, uh, but anyway, I am very grateful for the time that we spent. I don't know if you can think of anything that we missed, uh, but I really appreciated it. And I think this will be much better than, uh, than um, in from, I think this, this is a great discussion. Oh, let me just conclude with this, Rick. I like what you said about if you're married, studying the scripture with your wife. Uh, uh, I have found that couples that that interact together with the word of God, their their marriage is very, very different from those that have no shared connection with the word of God. Now, they might be both believers, but if you're not interacting the scripture together, uh, it's going to have your, your marriage is not going to thrive like it will if you study God's word together. Yeah, I and I totally agree. And when, when it first started, we found out we had a lot of communication holes uh, that were problematic and that we had to work through. So the Lord even healed us through doing that. So I just looking to live praiseworthy will bring the Lord will bring a lot of healing to us. Um, I can't say it's a guarantee, but I am saying that it's very powerful. So um, if, is it okay with you? I'm going to end in prayer. Um, if you want to pray too, you can, but I just want to bless you in your ministry and um, just, again, let everybody know to please go to loveisrael.org, um, go to Bible Study Company, check out the icon and please like and subscribe on both of our channels so that we can grow it. Because the problem is, is when you comment, when you hit the share buttons, when you hit the like buttons and you do hit the subscribe, it causes the logarithms to send it out more. It's almost like you're witnessing, you're sending this out so that people can um, hear it more. So please do so for both of us. It's helpful. Um, so, Lord, we just lift up our hearts to you and we lay them at your feet. Um, at the cross because you're our king. And we want to take the position that you are our king and that you are in control of our lives. Like Paul said in Romans 12, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's about it, what we have. Um, and so we just want to tell you how much we love you. We ask you to um, uh, we don't have any blessing in ourselves, but but you do, and we would implore you um, and grab a hold of your robe, in a sense, to uh, bless, uh, love Israel, and um, in, in in this way, in the way that they can get the word of God out, that will change um, people's hearts and minds, that would bless Brooke and Rivka so that that people would live praiseworthy. Please care for them in their ministry as you always do. But we just ask that you would do that and move on people's hearts. And so, Lord, we just ask you for safety and uh, wherever they go. And we thank you um, for their friendship and their love. And uh, just everything about them is a pleasure to have a relationship with them. But bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask your kingdom and your will to be done on all of us and those who are listening to us. In the name of Jesus, again, amen. Thank you, Rick. We we pray for you and Mary often. We, we ask God as well to bless Bible Study Company and the sacrifices and the investment that you are making in Bible Study Company for one purpose, and that is to bless others. So uh, uh, thank God for that. We, we, we bless you. We thank you. And thank you for allowing me to, to share some things in this uh, podcast. One other thing, you're going to be coming to Ocala, to our church, November 8th and 9th. And we're looking for, we're, we're t t to be determined, but we're thinking you could do a talk on marriage one night and prophecy the next. Whatever you'd like. We'll so, do it. Uh, we'll get some announcements out for people and you can share them too. We certainly will. Thank you. All right. Rick. I appreciate Blessings. it. Blessings. You bet. Bye. Bye-bye.